Hi there, it's Rebecca Rush back here, and we're going through Lincoln's legacy, Money Matters of the Civil War. One of the things that's important is we're recording this in October of 2021, and October is one of 160th anniversaries of the Civil War. Many things are going to be happening starting in 2021 that we will be hearing about uh, for the next several years as the Civil War issues are uh, brought forward. Lincoln was inaugurated in 1861 in March, and shortly after he was inaugurated, the state started to secede. The first state had actually, South Carolina had actually seceded in December of 1860, but thereafter, by the time he was inaugurated, there were seven other southern states that seceded. And when they went with them, they took major federal assets along. And Rick is going to talk about one of the couple of the most important ones as well. I believe that people were thinking that the Civil War wasn't going to last for very long. This was going to be kind of a blip. But in July of 1861, there was such a thing as the Battle of Bull Run. And people actually came out of Washington, D.C. and went to a picnic to watch this event. Unfortunately, it was a major loss for the Union, and people started to realize that instead of something that is going to be over in a few days or in a few weeks or in a few months, this is going to really be an all-out war, and the cost of the war was starting to mount. Some estimates were at $2 million a day because of the sinews of war being so important. There were not stores of ammunition. There weren't um, uniforms, shoes, some of the other things that are important for running and providing for an army. And in the bottom right, there is a wonderful little token of the Battle of Bull Run. And later on, in October of 1861, Abraham Lincoln, at the, on the foot, on the steps of the Treasury, he gave an appeal to the loyal women to try to have women who were at the home front start organizing and being able to make some provisions for the people who were the soldiers who were now out on camps and out on, um, on campaigns. We'll be discussing money matters from a larger context as well and in the books that we've written which include minting, printing, and counterfeiting, uh, the, the ten tumultuous years actually started in 1857 in our viewpoint when the Coinage Act of 1857 was put into place and that started to create scarcities of coins. Coins actually had not just numismatic value, but they actually had value in the context of having gold and silver and copper content, which is not too much in our, day, in our coinage today. But on with some of the things that Rick and Abraham Lincoln have spoken about recently, um, we did have major events such as the, um, the Legal Tender Act in 1862, the challenges with new mints being, uh, the, as the Confederacy fell, they took with them mints, and Rick is going to go into that in more detail. Other things began to happen, and not the least of which was the, um, the women's organizing came into full force, and they began raising money, lots of money, for the Union cause with sanitary fares. They actually started working for the Treasury, and this was sort of the early version of the Rosie the Riveter, which is not given much discussion. So this is just a brief, uh, very quick map of as the Confederacy started to fall, they took with them the Custom Houses, they took with them the three U.S. Mints that were in the South. The budget for the entire United States in 1859 was $81 million worth of income. 70% of that was coming from custom houses. So as the southern states seceded and took the customs houses with them, with them, then that loss of income began to hurt the United States as well, the Union as well. During the 1860s, this is a display of some of the coins that were still circulating. There were foreign coins. There was fractional currency. There were um, half dollar. There were, pardon me, three cent pieces, two cent pieces. And it had to have been a particularly challenging time for engaging in commerce because many of the merchants had to be able to deal with many of the different kinds of coinage that was available. But at the time, the United States did not have its own printed money. So there was really no small change during the start of the Civil War. The foreign coins were being obsoleted. 
and the people who had access to coins were hoarding them because it really had coinage value. There was really gold and really silver and really copper content. They wanted to keep that, and then the mints were, the southern mints had stopped production for the Union. So Rick, I'm going to pass the mic on over to you, and you can tell a little bit more about what was going on in the south, more south and the north and the mints. First of all, I want to let you all know there were only five mints in the United States, all operating actively in 1860. But when the South seceded, they took three of the five mints, lock, stock, and barrel, including all the bullion. <clears throat> and even though the Confederacy did want to create its own currency, they had to spend that bullion, both silver and gold, directly in Europe because they could not get any credit. So they found themselves with mints and very little to create coin with. In the North, it was in 1862 that the North started to create new mints, um, three brand new mints to replace or supplant the three that they lost in the South. But let me just show you where those mints were. So it, the ones that went to the South are Charlotte, North Carolina, Dahlonega, Georgia, and a very large, very massive mint in New Orleans. The one in New Orleans created everything from silver coin up to gold coins, but they never created a single penny, whereas Pennsylvania to the north is where the U.S. created its pennies. Now, Dahlonega and Charlotte were just minting gold mined in the Piedmont area right there, it created the demand for the mints in the 1830s. And these are just some of the coins that were created in the South. Here's the uh, famous New Orleans mint, uh, Big Fat O, a C down below for Charlotte, and a D, it's a C for Charlotte there, and a D up above for a $3 gold coin out of Delonica. Now, we had Colorado, Nevada, and Oregon all producing um, an enormous amount of silver and gold because of the Comstock load and because of a big gold strike that was discovered in eastern Oregon. I'll just go into a tiny bit more detail. Um, Denver, again, didn't produce a coin until the early 1900s, and it was an assay office for at least 40 years. Carson City, which of course is the famous double C mint mark, you can see it down there on the back of that Morgan dollar. That, mm, that mint only was in business from 1870 until 1878, although Abe approved the mint in 1863. And then the Dalles, Oregon, along the Columbia River, it was uh, approved by Abe Lincoln and was built, but never struck a single coin because by the time they built the thing in 1870, um, the Wells Fargo Company was in full swing. It could provide more transportation down to San Francisco. And the Transcontinental Railroad went right through the Dalles into Portland, made transportation of gold out to the ocean and south a lot easier and a lot safer. But we wanted to just mention how unique and how beautiful the Dalles is. I, uh, I got to know people out there. I interviewed people out there on the phone. It's in the shadow of Mount Hood and it's right along the Columbia River. It is the terminus for the Oregon Trail. So it was a very, very Wild West kind of town. And uh, let me just show you a little bit more about it. It had been a site for the Native Indians to have trading posts and abundant fishing for about 10,000 years. And when uh, the white settlers arrived and when the uh, pioneers arrived, uh, both populations got along quite well with each other, unlike in the of Georgia, where the uh, Creek Indians and the Cherokee were both driven off of the land. So uh, that's where the Trail of Tears came from, by the way. But that did not occur in Oregon. It was a very uh, successful community. And one little tale about coins that the, the people that were from Caucasian backgrounds and settlers, they found lots of Hudson Bay trading companies dating back as far as the 1600s that the Indians had been trading with and that they were left as talismans for the dead 
where they were buried on Memelus Island. Now the town is a really colorful place. I, I appreciate this a lot. The town still has a website that rolls out the welcome mat to pioneers, warriors, mountain men, floozies, and scalawags. It sounds like the kind of town I'd like to visit, but uh, there you go. That's, that's, uh, that was the Dow's then and, and today. And this is the Mint, believe it or not. It's now a brewing company. They had uh, you know, a rough time like everyone during the uh, uh, 2020 uh, COVID uh, scare. Uh, but they're getting back on their feet once more. This is the original brickwork in the basement where the gold was to be stored in silver. You can still see the, the, all the original work that's being restored. And you can see the original frames of the large, spacious windows that these diners are enjoying. But that was built in 1870, again with the approval of Abe Lincoln. Now, we mentioned the Wells Fargo Company. That's a really important development. They were just getting on their feet because of all the gold strikes in both California and Oregon. And most of their work in terms of protecting the gold that was coming down the Oregon River and the Oregon Trail would go into Portland, would be put onto ships and taken down to San Francisco. And while it was in transit, both on, sh on the land and down to the ocean, uh, the Wells Fargo Company was protecting it. It was later that the Wells Fargo got into protecting uh, valuables that were in transit and they had a very active line between San Francisco and Nevada, Virginia, Nevada. Um, and that really did start to change the way, you know, the necessity for the Dow's men dissipated once the Wells Fargo really became um, prevalent and powerful. Now, I want to mention the sinking of the brother Jonathan. It's a very, very well-documented treasure ship. It was a large paddle wheeler. And uh, it went from San Francisco to Portland, to Vancouver, and then back again. And a lot of people that are collectors have heard of it because there was a payroll invo involved. It went down in 1865 in the summer and took the entire golden payroll with it. All these coins were struck in San Francisco. However, Lincoln had appointed a fellow by the name of William Logan to be the first director of the Mint at the Dalles. And he was on board the Brother Jonathan that fateful summer when it sank and it took his life, the life of his wife, and all those coins went to the bottom of the ocean. It was sank just between the border between Oregon and California. It was very close to land. It was a very unfortunate circumstance. Now, the brother Jonathan figures into our history in a big way. You can see this strapping guy here. He has $50 million tattooed across his bulging bicep. This is Brother Jonathan, and he represented the United States before the Civil War and long before Uncle Sam became popular. He was not a paternal, grandfatherly, wonderful gentleman like Uncle Sam. He was more like a scrappy dock worker, and that's the way America liked to look at itself. John Bull, representing Britain, was pudgy and unathletic, and he was saying to Brother Jonathan when he got that first huge loan, that Abe talked about, he said, my God, Brother Jonathan, I had no idea you were so strong. And that's when America really started to show its strength when it borrowed that $50 million. Okay. Now, it's important to keep in mind that when the war was started, we minted money, but we did not print money. And so, in order to meet the extraordinary expenses of the war, with the Legal Tender Act and the, ultimately the National Bank Act, it was printing of money and not minting that became the way we financed everything. We started, the U.S. Treasury started with demand notes, which were gold-backed. Uh, they, they lasted about six months. They did a great job, but they did not carry the day. This is what those early demand notes look like. That's Winfield Scott who was um, a, a very popular man in the day. Um, you can see here 
that the, the note was signed by a guy named J.B. Stearns, Julius Brutus Stearns. He was a very famous artist. And this just represents the way that people could sign notes on behalf of the treasurer of the United States, but it would be their own name. And Becky will get a little bit more into that soon. As she mentioned earlier, by 1862, the expenses of a land war and a naval war for the Union was $2 million per day. We simply didn't have enough money to cover those debts at all. So we did pass the Legal Tender Act, which became an interest-free loan and a national currency, not redeemable in gold or silver. And this is a great political cartoon from the day showing Secretary of Treasury Fessenden, uh, who was only in office a short time, cranking out millions and millions of dollars on the federal presses. This is a gorgeous greenback with Salmon Chase Treasurer, pictured on the left. The green ink is the green tint ink that was at the time exclusive to the American Bank Note Company. And as, ben, as, as Lincoln and I discussed, the portraits were intended, intended to make the banking community feel more comfortable, to show someone familiar, somebody in authority, was backing up all this money. This is a good example of a fractional note. We had so little spare, small change that the government got into creating five cent notes, 10 cent notes, etc. And here's a beautiful example of a green back, the entire back of this $100 bill was using that famous green tint ink. Now, I've talked about this earlier in the show, but Abe Lincoln was the only president to appear on both, uh, on, a five, on, a, on a federal note, in this case a fractional note for 50 cents, when he was alive and then posthumously because in 1866, a law was passed in America that outlawed the likeness of any living person to be on our currency. And this note here with General Sherman and General Grant, which was printed in 1866, the, the year that law went through, it's a beautiful note. It was intended to honor these two guys as the, the winners of the war, if you would. Anyway, the law passed in the U.S. Congress. They felt it was too vainglorious. They felt it was too much like uh, European monarchies to have living people on the note. And they printed tens of thousands of these notes, but apparently they never went into circulation. And of course, you can see notes with Abe Lincoln on any note to this day. Now in the South, it's a whole different story. Um, they never printed their own money. There were about six or seven different printing plants in the South that handled the printing of all this currency. It was not backed by gold or silver. It created enormous uh, inflation during the war, which probably was one of the largest causes of the failure of the South. So anyway, the bottom line, 1.7 billion, give or take, was printed by the South. That's just the Confederacy, but there were still notes being had, created by all the states in the South. And they were totally worthless by the end of the war. Now, one thing that's worth noting, unique to the Confederacy and not to the North, two women, living women, appeared on Confederate and Southern notes. Uh, this is a lady by the name of Lucy Pickens. Uh, she was married to the governor of the state of South Carolina. She was considered to be the belle of the South, and she managed to raise millions of dollars because of connections she had with Russia to give to the South, and she appeared on several different bonds. And you can see the C up there, and the 100 over on that side. I always like to remind people that it was called a C note, that slang note came from the Roman numeral for 100, which appears on a lot of currency during the Civil War. So your C note slang started right here. This is a circulating treasury note, also with a green tint no, uh, ink of some kind down in the South. And then the lady over here, Juliet Hopkins of Alabama, she appeared on a 50 cent fractional note and uh, she gave almost everything she owned on this earth to the South. And when she died at the age of 90 something, she was the only woman buried with full military honors at Arlington National Cemetery. Now, you'll see on that note here, it's a $5 Confederate note. It's a lithography by <clears throat> Evans and Cockwell, 
there in Charleston, South Carolina, they printed most of the Confederate paper money. And um, they, they had a rather hard time because of their selection of a new location. I'll explain myself. They decided to move from Charleston in 1864 because there was always a bombardment from the Naval Union blockade. They said, oh, we're not safe enough here. Let's go inland. Let's go to Columbia, South Carolina. They built a big printing plant there in 1864, just in time for Union General William T. Sherman and his 60,000 bummers to come to town. And uh, Charleston was the least popular of all the southern cities. They torched it. They torched the uh, Evans and Cogswell uh, printing plant, uh, which eventually made a comeback. But um, it, it was not exactly a, a great choice to go from Charleston apparently to Columbia, South Carolina. Now we also mentioned in our interview with Abe Lincoln that the Internal Revenue Service got started in 1862, really. It was a second revenue measure, but we didn't really have very many internal taxes until the war. And uh, it was intended to, of course, to be a wartime measure to have that Internal Revenue Service known as the Bureau of Revenue at the time. But it wasn't until 1913 that it became a permanent part of the federal government. It went in and went out. But as you know, the Internal Revenue Service has been with us for over, well over 100 years. Now, we talked about Hugh McCulloch and a, a little bit about Hugh's views. I'll try to make this a little quick. Do you have any sign of anything moving? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll just move by this very quickly. We covered this with Lincoln. He's very much in favor of a national bank. He believes that the currency should be as safe as their own government in a speech to Congress, 1862. Now, this is Hugh, uh, after his death, of course. He appeared on national currency, a national banknote, and um, he was the father, really, of the national banks. Uh, Sam and Chase created the legislature Hugh McCulloch had to carry out the law, and uh, he was very, very in in instrumental in making sure that national banks worked and that we had adequate money for the treasury. And when he came into office, there were zillions of notes. Some people say between 8,000 and 30,000 notes being printed north and south. This is just a small sample. and. It was actually more chaotic in many ways than the foreign money that was circulating until 1857 because money had different values and different discount rates when you traveled away from the town in which the bank was located. This is a great example of some of the notes. There's one from the state of Georgia, one from the Franklin Silk Company. There's an apothecary that put out its own money and the state of Alabama. And this is a treasury note. Uh, again, this was implemented by Hugh. You can see again the C for 100, the C note. You can see the green tint note. It's March of 1864 when this note came out. If you became, if your bank became a national bank, you had to buy a certain formula that was established to buy these treasury notes and keep them as a reserve. And that money helped to finance the war. And this is a great chart, I'll make it fast. But the National Bank Act was passed in 1863, and this is 1865 by the end of the war. The assets and millions in the national banks in the beginning was 16 million, give or take. But by the end of the war, 1.126 billion dollars. And the, the assets in the state banks went from nearly 1.2 billion down to 165 million. So it totally flip-flopped in terms of the strength of the national banks in just three short years. Now, uh, he was very mindful uh, of the fact that the Shermans and the Grants got all the credit, but he actually in his memoirs said it was the successful general who was the recipient of public honors, not the man by whose agency the sinews of war were supplied. And it goes in on in fine print to say the movements of the armies, the great battles that were fought with varying success on both sides, so absorbed the public attention that comparatively little interest was felt in the measures that were adapted to provide the means 
to meet the enormous and daily increasing demands upon the U.S. Treasury. And he was also very, very, very old school when it came to gold and silver. He just felt that basically there's no real money except gold and silver. And it's unfortunate that this fact was not appreciated when the legal tender acts were passed. One more much less well-known uh, law that was passed and then rescinded was the Anti-Gold Futures Act of July 1864. They were trying to pass a law that provide, prevented gold from being traded like a commodity so they could stabilize the value of paper money against gold. Uh, it was rescinded within about two weeks of being passed. And basically Hughes said that governments are impotent to give anything more than a limited and artificial value to banknotes that are not convertible into coin. One more thing for you guys that are collectors and gals. There was no such thing as a nickel during the Civil War. As a matter of fact, since 1793 until 1865, there were half dimes. We were, our whole system was based on decimals, so you had a half dime and a dime, but you had no such thing as a nickel. And it was because of Joe Wharton, the guy who founded the Wharton Business School, who was very successful during the war in creating smelting plants for nickel, Joe was the one that sold Hugh on adopting the first nickel in America. Now, counterfeiting was incredibly rampant. 30% of all currency and bonds were fakes by the end of the war. And so Abraham Lincoln chose William P. Wood, who happened to be the head of the D.C. jail, to be the first chief of the new Secret Service, and that was part of the Treasury. Had nothing to do with protecting the president, had everything to do with going after counterfeiters. This is a great image that comes from the Secret Service website showing that pistol-wielding federal agent coming in the door, breaking up a counterfeiting ring. You got the old press there churning out coins, you guys, you guys back there smelting. You have someone with a scale doing the assaying and they're busted by the Secret Service. So, it's up to you now, Vicki. Women also had a role during the Civil War. Hundreds of thousands of men left their homes, left their farms, left their stores, and left the women to be in charge of some of these uh, um, positions that they had not previously been fully in charge of. But one of the other major opportunities for women was an, in the federal government and in the U.S. Treasury. The other thing that women wound up doing, who did not come to Washington, D.C. for their jobs, was get organized and created a, a tremendous network of supplying, we'll keep calling it the sinews of war, to keep that war machine going and to keep their loved ones, who were off now fighting, as comfortable as was at all possible. So the first character that we would like to introduce is Francis Spinner. And I'll be very brief with Francis, but he became a, a, the U.S. Treasurer in 1861. And um, one of the things I'd like to call your attention to is this amazing signature, which you see underneath his picture. You'll see it on other paper money that he signed throughout the war, but it is in itself quite a, quite a novelty to have a signature of that uniqueness. But here's a picture of um, Mr. Spinner, Treasury Secretary Spinner, on the uh, printed money. And he came from, uh, Lincoln brought him in from the Mohawk Bank in New York. He had, at that time, as Rick had previously mentioned, the banks were printing their own money for circulation locally. And he felt and he learned that if he recruited his wife and daughters to do the clipping and the cutting of the paper money that the bank issued, they did it extremely well. They were, as he had said in a memoir, they were used to using scissors. So these seamstresses had the ability to clip away with the scissors and did a wonderful job. And as a footnote on that little story, he also said, and I hardly had to pay them. So we've got a, a bonus here. So what did he <laughs> decide to do? He and Lincoln, as the soldiers, as the clerks who had been working for the U.S. Treasury, started going off to war. That created a gap in the, in the ability of hiring people 
to serve in the Treasury Department. Not only was there a gap, but now there's a new industry. As Rick had mentioned, we now have the, um, the Legal Tender Act, where we are printing our own money. And we're printing lots of money. The printed sheets are coming down from New York for, for um, images on a page. They all have to be cut apart. So Spinner says, hey, I know how to solve this problem. We're going to start hiring women. He did indeed hire women. He hired up to 400 women during the Civil War. And these women became known as the Treasury Girls. The Treasury Girls were some of the early Rosie the Riveters. They came to Washington, D.C. Many of them had come on recommendation um, by having sent letters to either President Lincoln or to Mr. Spinner saying, I am a widow. My husband died during the Civil War. I really need a job now. And so these were the women who were preferred for these positions. And the male, the, they worked from nine to five. It was a good job. It was a clean job. Other women had been working in factories. Maybe they had to be working at farms. But this was a good, this was good work. And the women were earning $600 a year, which at that time was respectable. However, it was only half of what the male clerks had earned. But nonetheless, women had now entered the civil service workforce. Um, the image here is showing women who are all clustered together and doing their work in the Bureau of the Currency. They're doing their clipping and they're doing their signing. Um, as was mentioned, women were able to sign the bills where originally the, there had been a thought that the, um, the treasurer would have to hand sign every bill. Once you get to the industrial volume of our printing, it became in, impractical for that. So the women were asked to sign their own names to the documents. And this is now a treasure trove for genealogists. This was also the case in the South. So Confederate women, Confederate men who were clerks did in many cases sign their own, the, the paper money for the treasurer. So women are now solidly in the workforce. Um, so if you are, if you're looking for indications of who these women might have been, it really could be your great great grandmother that was signing a, um, a U.S. greenback or a piece of Confederate paper money. But women were, were doing much more than coming to Washington for their jobs. Women were asked to do something from the home front. And this is where a lot of organizing took place. There had been many church circles, there were sewing circles, there were a number of different charitable groups, but none of the groups had really focused on one central cause. And Abraham Lincoln gave a message from the steps of the U.S. Treasury Building, October 1st, 1860, 1861, which is just 160 years ago from about three weeks ago. And his, one of the essence comments was in support of the Sanitary Commission. The Sanitary Commission was a group of volunteers who went to create more healthful conditions out in the service territories, at the hospitals, and to serve the troops wherever they were needed. But there were many women who did not leave and go to follow the troops and to serve in that capacity, but they organized to, as the call to action had suggested, to, um, to sew, to knit, to knit socks, to make shirts, to do some of the things, to cook, to can, to preserve, to do all these things that, according to President Lincoln, the U.S. government just was not prepared to be able to do. And his comment was, no nation has ever been able to support a wartime effort adequately. And this is an opportunity for women in the home front to support those soldiers that had to go away to war. And today, what we see are collectibles that come from that period in time. On this particular slide, there's an image, uh, there is a, um, a, an image of a badge that was from the Great Philadelphia Fair of 1864. The women started creating fairs. They felt that, yes, it was okay to be sending stuff to the soldiers, which again, I'll put into context. There were no cell phones. There was no interstate highway system. There was no internet computer system. 
So these women are gathering things and moving them along to the home, to the uh, battlefronts to take care of the soldiers. And they started realizing there are ways better to do this. Perhaps we should start raising money. Let's use these organizational benefits to create a fair. And for many people, this would be akin to like a state fair. They were week, maybe two weeks long. And the women across the various states would organize and have goods and services collected, donated to the fair, which were then sold or raffled off. And the money from the fair is going to the um, the union. There are examples of things that were sold at the fair, such as stamps and ribbons, and many are very scarce, and so they're very collectible as well. And to the point of how much money was made, these are not small matters. Um, the women were able to raise, um, in the Philadelphia area, that fair raised over a million dollars. You take back into consideration that a one dollar in, in the 1860s was equivalent to twenty-five dollars today. This is a monumental amount of money that was raised. In Maryland, in Baltimore, that fair raised three hundred thousand dollars, which doesn't sound like a lot, but bear in mind that Maryland was a border state. And President Lincoln and Mary Todd Lincoln came to that fair and supported that fair. Uh, dignitaries from Washington, D.C. came to the fair. So this was also a very big deal, but they were not only on the eastern seaboard. The fairs took place in Cincinnati and out in St. Louis. And just this particular chart shows that, um, and, and I don't know what the totals were at other fairs, but this is a pretty darn good um, indication that these women were extremely well organized and raised a tremendous amount of money for the union cause. Now by the time the war had actually ended, there was still fervor, there was still support for the Union troops, and I'd just like to briefly mention about Milwaukee. Milwaukee was in an area where the soldiers were coming home, and many of the soldiers were disabled. Now they are injured. They're coming to try to reclaim their jobs, and they have a disability. Many, um, war to, the war actually, actually created widows and poverty in many areas. The fair that took place in Milwaukee was a fair that raised money specifically for, um, for the purchase of land and the purchase of a building, or to, uh, to the money to build a building. This building became one of the first three hospitals or asylums for disabled Union volunteer soldiers. This became the framework for the Veterans Administration, and the approval for this particular law that got passed was in March of 1865, shortly before Lincoln was assassinated. So we also think of Abe Lincoln as one of the founders of the Veterans Administration as well. In terms of collectability, the Grand Army of the Republic continued on, and people recognized that the women needed things to um, con connect with one another, the men needed a way to connect with one another, and the Grand Army of the Republic continues to this day as in the name of the Sons of, Confeder Sons of Union veterans. There's an organization called the Women's Relief Corps that continues to this day. And there are the collectability of the tokens, of the medals, of the, of the badges from these events that, have held, that are held regularly are things that you see at coin shows and they're, um, ex they're, they are good mementos of this particular time and considerably valuable. So the last thing we want to mention is that Abe Lincoln is a money president. And so the next time you look at a $5 bill, the next time you see Abe Lincoln's on a $5 bill or even on a penny, start thinking about the fact that money matters of the Civil War were prevalent and that the Civil War changed our money and our money changed the war. So thank you all very much on behalf of the Abe Lincoln and Money Matters section of the PAN show.